Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching today's Ag Forecast brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions, your premier platform for real-time global insights. What I'd like to do at the beginning of this video is just kind of give a quick review of the storm complex that went from parts of the north, uh, excuse me, the South Dakota and northern border of Nebraska through parts of Iowa into parts of southern Wisconsin, Illinois, and Indiana. This large damaging squall line, which we call a derecho, uh, did produce numerous reports of severe weather. And I'd like to take a moment at the beginning of this video to kind of explain to you the structure of these storms systems. So on the top here, what I'm giving you is a cross-sectional view of one of these storms. So in other words, if you were to take one of these and cut it right like this, what would things look like as you go from one side to the other? Well, the storm motion there moving toward the east, we can see that on the leading edge we have our main updraft. But the part of the storm that makes it so damaging is the backside, where we have most of the precipitation. These storms are able to generate what we call a rear inflow jet. It's a downdraft on the backside of the storm that comes sliding in like this, hits the ground, and spreads out horizontally producing a lot of straight line wind damage. It ends up producing on radar the telltale characteristic of a squall line, which is a bow echo. That's where the leading edge of the storms tends to bow forward, as you see over there in the image that's on the right. Again, that image on the right is a radar reflectivity image. The colors tell you the intensity of the precipitation. But the feature that we have to talk about is that rear inflow jet, because that's what produces the damaging straight line winds. And if we look over here at our Doppler radar image, so that's the radial velocities telling us how fast it's moving, you can see that right in through this part of the storm, the rear inflow jet was producing at about a thousand feet above the ground, wind speeds that were 122 miles an hour as this went racing toward the Illinois-Iowa border. Uh, as those winds got closer to the ground, they did slow down, but not too much, and this is what gave us so much damage across this area. In total, this storm system was about 700 miles long. That's how far it traversed. It took about 14 hours, which gives us an average storm speed of about 55 miles an hour. We uh, received over 500 reports of severe winds and 15 tornado reports. Most of those were from northern Illinois. That map that you see here is looking uh, at two different things. The color coding in the background is from the RTMA data set. It gives us the maximum hourly average wind. So not gust, but hourly averaged winds. And so this is where we kind of get this idea that the storm system is moving along somewhere between 40 and 60 miles an hour at times. What I've overlaid on top of that are the severe wind reports. And we can see here that these severe winds ranged from 60 miles an hour in some locations upwards of 90 to 110 miles an hour in total. What I'd like to do is I'd like to just take a moment here and show you some satellite imagery to understand how we're going to assess how much uh, of this crop was damaged. So NASA worldview data here, go Google that. It's a great resource. This is what things look like. Let me slide this over. This is how things look like before the storm system got there. So last clear day we had July 28th. You can see this particular section of Iowa. As I slide this over, what we're now able to see is the damage swath. And it's going to become a lot more clear with time as to how much damage we got as we really start to see the discoloration in through this area in through here over toward the Illinois border, which is right now being obscured by these high thin cirrus that we had here on the 11th uh, of, of August. Uh, what I was waiting for yesterday was to see how things shaped up in Illinois. So let's do the same thing. We're going to go to the 28th. That's the image that you see here. And then as I pull this across, what we're going to end up getting uh, is the data from the 12th. Now, as I rock this back and forth, you're going to notice that we don't quite see the same level of discoloration compared to the previous day where we didn't have that storm damage. So I think a lot of the damage in Illinois is a bit more local than it was in parts of Iowa. But based on this analysis, I come up with around eight and a half million acres that I think was a, a damaged here in corn and soybeans. Some of the estimates are above 10 million acres. So I just want to uh, kind of give you my analysis of this. As we go back to our presentation, I would like to let you know that some research done by one of my former students, Corey Gaustini, along with Lance Bosart here, shows that this is the region uh, this time of year that tends to have the greatest frequency of these squall line events that end up producing derecho type winds. And just to remind you, back in July of 2011, that was the last time I think this area was hit by such a large and damaging derecho event. And also in 2011, April 19th and 20th produced this event in parts of the Eastern Corn Belt and Mid-South. 2011, as we talked about on Monday, it was one of our busiest years in terms of severe wind reports. And one of the reasons why was because of this date. Just want to show you one last piece here. On the 4th of April 2011, we had our record setting day from the Storm Prediction Center with nearly 1,500 reports of severe weather, most of those coming from strong straight line winds. And if you'd like to take a moment and go to this website up here, you can uh, learn a lot more about derechos if you're, if you're interested in how they form and historically what they have done in terms of damage across the United States. And on this next 
next animation, we're looking at radar reflectivity early this morning. And what we're keeping an eye on here is where our thunderstorm complexes were in the overnight hours and into the early morning hours. Extremely heavy rainfall in parts of the mid-Atlantic yesterday. We can still see some storms moving through parts of Virginia. And also the storms that are coming out of Kansas into Oklahoma early this morning, putting down some hail yesterday and also this morning some flooding. Meanwhile, cutting out of parts of Minnesota into northern Wisconsin, we do have some pretty heavy rainfall. And if we just take a look at the last 24 hours of total accumulated precipitation, we can see each of these events. The heavier rain in parts of the Mid-Atlantic, the scattered storms that were over parts of the southeast, some of which producing some heavy rains. And then these storms right in through here, coming on the border of Oklahoma, Arkansas, and Texas, some storms there producing uh, some flash flooding with rainfall amounts uh, totaling up on radar here over six inches. But as we look back on yesterday, when taking a look at our satellite imagery here, we can see what we're going to continue to see for quite some time. And that is a lot of daily convective activity here over the southeast getting up into the mid-Atlantic. A lot of thunderstorm activity in the near term. We can also see the bigger storms that popped up in the high plains here. Uh, some of those storms producing some very locally heavy rainfall and also some extremely large uh, anvils. See the storms that went up here into parts of southern Saskatchewan out of parts of Montana and South Dakota. Huge storms. But as I was watching this animation, I was looking there over the southwestern part of the United States, specifically into Southern California, where we, if we zoom in, we can actually see one of the latest fires that has uh, broken out there. Now, this satellite animation then switches over. You can see right here into an infrared and notice the heat signature that is coming off of the fire here. I believe they're calling this the lake fire uh, right in this particular point. We can then see uh, from uh, some webcams here what that fire looked like yesterday including some of the pyrocumulus that formed on top of it. So California of course dealing with some some pretty uh, intense heat and also some drier conditions leading to some of these fires. Now talking about that heat that is where it's going to be in the foreseeable future. What I've got here here is the um, all hazards weather map which shows us the heat advisors that are in the southern plains you can see the red flag warnings that are here parts of Utah Wyoming Colorado and we're gonna see some windier days that are gonna extend to the northern plains as well meanwhile when you get over to the southwest and, and then into parts of California we do have the excessive heat watches and warnings that are in place uh, and over on the East Coast well we're gonna continue to do with our flooding threat uh, in through parts of the mid-Atlantic here as we look forward in this forecast by the way before I go any farther I would like to show you that Phoenix right now over the last 71 days so this is from June through um, early August here is currently having its hottest summer on record uh, averaging averaging a max temperature of 107.9 degrees Fahrenheit and that heat isn't going anywhere anytime soon so uh, earlier this week we talked about the flow coming through the North Pacific all right we saw these three troughs that were lined up here and we saw ridges that were over the warmer waters that are off in the north pacific and also the ridge we anticipated developing here over the southwest it's going to be that ridge that's going to really be a major factor in the heat over the southwest and it's going to control our pattern i think for much of the next 10 days now leaving the south edge of this trough right in through here we are going to watch the northern plains to have a multi-day severe weather event here as this next front comes through and while it looks pretty stagnant over the southeast we are watching the competition between high pressure developing over the Great Lakes and high pressure that's out over the Atlantic producing a nearly stationary boundary right in through there, this area on which we're going to see a lot of thunderstorm activity. So given that as our setup, let's go straight into the severe weather first. The top two images uh, that, uh, that you see up there, that's the day one and day two uh, severe weather outlook from the Storm Prediction Center. And as you can see, parts of the Dakotas getting into Minnesota is where we're going to keep a very close eye on today. Our uh, own severe weather index has me also watching this area right in through here later on today as possibly having a, a strong to severe storms as well. So I wouldn't be surprised if the National Weather Service upgraded that area uh, too. So so after all the heavy rain we saw in the last 24 hours, we're going to watch once again for this same area to be seeing strong to severe storms. On day two, we can see the main front really sweeping through parts of Minnesota. So once again, severe weather here in, in parts of the northern plains getting over to the in the northern Corn Belt. And we'll watch here on our, uh, our own index on, on Friday evening for this area as that front comes through to really destabilize, potentially giving us more strong to severe storms that could be sweeping through that part of Iowa that just endured some severe weather. And as we get into the day on uh, day three here, which would be uh, Saturday, we're going to see that front trying to sweep through the eastern Corn Belt, but not really able to work with too much moisture there to produce what I think won't be nearly as prolific of, of strong storms as we're going to see over the next couple of days. 
From the National Weather Service, we can see their total accumulated precipitation map here for the next seven days. And again, it's going to feature that nearly stationary boundary over parts of the Mid-Atlantic into the southeast, producing some very heavy rainfall. You can also see the severe weather and how much precipitation we are anticipating coming out of the Dakotas into Minnesota. But due to some high pressure that will build here in the interim, we do notice there's kind of a drier corridor tucked in between these two areas. And with the heat building around that ridge over the southwest, we will see scattered storms in through this region, right in through here, but certainly this is going to shut down our monsoon, making things exceptionally dry and hot uh, for Arizona. Doing a little bit of a model comparison here, this is what the GFS has picked up on over the next seven days in terms of total accumulated precipitation. And if we compare that to the European, which is here, we see some similarities, but we also, of course, see some differences. Specifically in this section here of, uh, of the Eastern Cromwell getting over toward like Pennsylvania, New York. The GFS is here, and this is the European. The European a little bit farther to the south with the heavier rainfall in that area. We could be bringing in some heavier rain down into parts of the Delta. There's a region down here that's been quite dry over the last 14 days. Uh, but overall, you see that both models are picking up on a pretty similar overall path of what this is going to look like. So let's dig right into the European to kind of see things play out here. As we move this forward, let me pause it there and take you back and talk about some of the details. Throughout the day today, getting into this evening, again, we're going to watch this area this evening for the risk of strong to severe storms and also right in through here. We can see the scattered storms that are in parts of the Mid-South getting over into the Southeast as well. As we go from uh, Thursday evening, into the uh, early Friday morning hours and then watch again. Here comes the main frontal boundary sweeping through on Friday evening into this area. So there's two days here of getting strong to severe storms. What you're going to notice in this animation is that almost every day, kind of bordered here by the Mississippi and the Ohio River to the south and east, we're going to keep seeing daily convective activity as we press forward. So this is Friday evening, working our way into Saturday morning. Saturday afternoon and evening. So our main frontal boundary is in through this area, but as it comes through parts of Wisconsin, Michigan, Illinois, Indiana, not nearly producing the same amount of rainfall that we saw it produce as it came through parts of the Northern Plains. Again, mid-Atlantic to the Southeast, watching those storms pop on Saturday evening. As we work our way into early next week, this is Sunday evening, now working into Monday morning, afternoon and evening. We can see that things are going to get a better chance to maybe dry down here early next week throughout parts of the Corn Belt. As we play this through Tuesday, now getting into Wednesday and Thursday, you can see the drier conditions that we are forecasting during that time period. So this plays us out through the next week and we see a very similar setup here with more of our storm systems racing through Canada and the daily convection over parts of the southeast. But let's take a look at what that upper level flow pattern looks like in the operational GFS, which is on the left, and the European on the right as I go all the way out to next Thursday morning. Both models are keeping a pretty robust southwestern ridge and a broad trough here over the east. But we do notice coming out of the Gulf of Alaska, even though they have kind of different amplitudes on that trough, we're going to keep swinging systems through this same area running over the top of this ridge. So as we go out to day 10, uh, we can kind of see that effect. Interesting bit of differences here. The GFS does move the ridge a little bit farther to the west, excuse me, to the east, while the European kind of anchors it a bit farther to the west. But I still anticipate stormy activity up here in parts of the Canadian prairies as these troughs go through. And the presence of this broader trough over the southeast is going to keep things cool in parts of the eastern part of the United States. But looking at what this means in terms of total accumulated precipitation, you can see that more active storm track here through the Canadian prairies. It's actually showing up in both models. I have a bit more zoomed in version over here from the GFS. Uh, but one thing I've seen is the GFS has gone a little bit drier in this area as it's flattened out the upper level flow. But still, getting over here in the Appalachian Mountains toward the mid-Atlantic, toward the southeast, both models want to keep week two, which gets us all the way out to the 27th of the month uh, dry. I'll make a comment in through this area. What I don't see is a permanent shutdown of Gulf moisture. So while both models are suggesting drier than normal, I think we will still see a lot of regional thunderstorm development during this time period. Moving our discussion over towards temperatures, this is high temperatures compared to normal today on Thursday. You can see the trough in the northwest, the heat that's racing up parts of the high plains here with a lot of triple digit heat getting up there into the upper 90s as far north as parts of uh, up toward like Mitchell, South Dakota. But as I play this forward, watch the temperatures change here in the near term. The heat will really begin to build west. Friday's high temperatures here, departure from normal. 
As we get into the weekend and that front starts to pull through, you can see the cool down that's going to be happening for much of the Corn Belt getting over to the east. And then watch the heat from Texas all the way up to the west coast. We're now going to go back up toward the triple digit mark in the Columbia Basin with a lot of low 100s here in the Central Valley of California. Phoenix, 112 is what we're expecting for Sunday's highs. Working into next week, it's much of the same. Monday's high temperatures, here's Tuesday and Wednesday. So that pattern which adjusts into this broader ridge over the west in the deeper trough over the east, while well, we go back into those cooler summer temperatures here, getting our highs somewhere around 80 degrees rather than what we could be getting this time of year, which is much, much warmer. From there, let's go out to the six to 10 day time period. We have seen in the most recent model runs, pretty consistent uh, patterns suggesting cooler than average weather as we get out here toward the third week of the month of August with more of our heat in the Western United States, especially in California as advertised here by our latest model runs. Uh, areas that I think may be biased a bit too warm could be parts of the Pacific Northwest. We may get more troughs as you saw sliding through there, which would prevent it from getting uh, too hot. And we're gonna, gonna need to watch the evolution of the cooler weather that we have over the eastern half of the country pretty closely as we see this pattern evolve because that ridge does it really stay over the southwest or does it broaden with time we're going to keep an eye on that all right but going all the way out to days 11 through 15 we see the models continue to advertise most of the warmth to the west and that's what we're uh, really picking up on here from there, I would like to talk to you quickly about the tropics. We are watching Tropical Depression 11. Uh, we'll have to see if this uh, early morning updates uh, have increased the strength of this system to become Tropical Storm Josephine. But at this particular point, and we'll kind of spare you the details right now, we're not going to see the system intensify too much over the coming days. It has to do with dry air and wind shear. The GFS model curling it out to open ocean around a large high pressure cell that's going to be sitting here. I'll put it up on the European as well. We can see the European favoring that similar track. So at this point through the next five to seven days, I'm not anticipating this being a threat uh, to the United States. One last thing I would like to talk about here. Uh, big changes we've seen in the MJO recently continue with it coming out of phase four and five and running back over to phase one and two where it spent so much time in May, June, and July. So that is gonna keep a lot of the upper level dynamics over the Pacific such that we get sinking motion in the atmosphere with better rising motion over Africa and India, uh, Indian Ocean, excuse me. So this is gonna continue during the heart of our hurricane season to allow for better tropical cyclone development of easterly waves coming off of Africa. And finally, something I'm working on for the next couple of weeks here, we have seen lately a very wet harvest. I've got 2019 in October in the upper left, 2018 in the upper right, and 2017 in the bottom. And through sections in the mid part of the country into the Midwest and Corn Belt, we have struggled at times to get a crop out due to too much wet weather. Well, with the La Nina shaping up this year, uh, the weak La Nina, we're gonna need to be discussing what that might mean toward our late summer and fall fall uh, weather. And so I'll be working on it for you. I'll be able to report that to you in the next couple of weeks of what I'm thinking for fall. And uh, we'll finish this up uh, right here. I appreciate your attention this week. Have a good finish to your week and we'll talk to you again soon. Thank you.